Hi everybody, Jeremy here. I bring you the latest Copernicus climate change data every month on Euronews. And if you have ever fancied becoming a part-time climate scientist, you're in the right place. Tell us a bit about the project and then I'm going to bring up the scary fish. And, uh, <laughs> tell us quickly about your, your project. We're talking citizen science in our latest live on YouTube and a lot of the projects do involve musty old papers. We had to vacuum clean them for fungus because they were very old and they'd been stored and tucked away for a great many years. And if you're more of an outdoorsy kind of citizen scientist, you can spend your time looking out for scary fish. So if you fish it and you eat it, uh, then it has a powerful uh, toxin. And if you eat one, yeah, you might get paralyzed and die. Um, and yeah. it's come through the Suez Canal. So let's meet our citizen science project leaders, Gregoire Luis from Vigi Nature, watching wildlife in France. Kuhn Hufkins from Jungle Weather, digitizing old records from the Congo. Sarah Sparrow, climateprediction.net, borrowing your computer to simulate the future of Earth. Martin Stendhal and Adam Jonkronik, who are digging into old Danish weather records. Joachim Garabu, Observadores del Mar, watching how the Med is changing and bringing it all together is Stefan Brunemann, our Swiss climatologist. What are the big gaps there are in our understanding um, of you know, past weather, and what what does that really mean for our understanding of climate change? There are, of course, still many gaps, especially when it comes to um, like decadal scale variability of climate. Uh, why some periods in the past were um, flood rich, um, some not. Uh, why there were long lasting droughts, for instance. It's not only useful for climate science. The history is fascinating. So the captain here writes in the logbook that it has been too windy. We couldn't. Uh, uh, carry on uh, with the fight against the Swedes. We can, uh, you know, that was on the 1st of October uh, 1710, the uh, sea battle in Köhebukt, which is uh, right south of Copenhagen, and there was no winner because it was too windy. So in this case, we actually know uh, what it looks like. Yeah, so you find little gems like that all over the record. So. Um, they would make little notes in, 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 you know, in a margin, if you will. And so in this case, there was a, a, a partial solar eclipse uh, in 1933. Sarah, tell us a bit about your project, what you're doing, and uh, the kind of fascinating network all around the world that you're building. What we do is we, we use idle time on people's home computers so that we can run um, weather and climate model simulations. And so um, me, me with my with my getting on for six or seven year old computer, could I be helpful for you in any way with that old machine? Uh, yes, definitely you could. Oh, you just sort of sign up to the project, and if that's what you want to do, you can leave it at that, and it will kind of go itself and um, sort of download models and and run them and and send data back to us. So what we do is we try to push people to, to participate into citizen science, which are very standardized. The very last results, which came last year, is that, in fact, the community of plants are very affected by uh, climate change. The time scale and the space scale are just unreachable with usual uh, science uh, ways. All this data about what's happening now and in the past brings us to one conclusion, best summed up by our climatologist Stefan Brunemann. Of course, the last um, 150 years, they have this huge trend in it that we uh, can compare with past climate and we do not find anything like that. The past doesn't help us to find an analogue for the future. You can watch the entire hour-long discussion by clicking up here or in the description. And of course, you can see all of the latest Copernicus climate data in our Climate Now playlist or on euronews.com slash climate now. And I'll see you soon.